Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated. Hey, Jesse, I like them boots. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good to see you again. How many of you, this is your very first Believer's Convention? Would you hold up your hand? Stand up. Let us see you. Let us officially welcome you. Great. We're glad you're here. Is anybody in here besides Brother Copeland, Gloria, and me that's never missed a Believer's Convention? <laughs> anybody made all the Believer's Conventions? Brother Nichols over there, he's made them all. Praise God. That's awesome. And just look at us. Yeah, look at us. We look great, don't we? Praise God. We're blessed. Hallelujah. Anybody else in here blessed? Well, look at somebody's smile real big and say, isn't it wonderful to be blessed? Would you open your Bibles uh, this afternoon to Galatians? Galatians chapter 1, first of all. I want to lay a foundation for what I'm going to be talking to you about all week. Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul makes this statement in verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I looked back over some notes in my archives this week, or last week actually, and right here on this platform in the early 90s, about 90, 91, I was, Brother Copeland had asked me to come out to speak on a Thursday evening. And uh, as he was introducing me, he said, Jerry, the word of the Lord has come to me. And this is what he said. God is moving you into a new dimension of ministry. He's adding to your life and ministry the office of the seer. He will begin to show you in the spirit things to come, and he will hold you responsible for sharing those things with the body of Christ wherever you go. Come now and tell us what you've seen. And then uh, that same year, I was in California, and Brother Hagan was preaching in Riverside. And I had Saturday night off. I was preaching in several different communities there in Southern California, but I had Saturday night off. I knew Brother Hagan was in Riverside, so I planned to go over and get in on his meeting. I was way over on the other side of L.A. and started driving over to Riverside got in all that traffic and actually began to realize that I wasn't going to get there on time. Uh, but I continued to go and was not going to miss that meeting, even though I did get there uh, somewhere around 8.15, 8.30, even though the service started at 7 or 7.30. And when I walked in the door, they were still singing. Brother Hagen was on the platform. And when I walked in the back door, uh, I had not announced that I was coming, did not ask anybody to save me or seat anything. But when I walked in the back door, Brother Hagen stood up and he said, he's here now, you can stop. And they stopped the singing. And he said, Brother Jerry, God told me you'd be here tonight. Come up here, I have a word for you. And he began to talk to me about moving into a new dimension of ministry. And uh, it was quite a lengthy prophetic word. And Obviously, it blessed me, but it very much sounded, or it sounded very similar to what Brother Copeland had said. And then one of my most prized treasures in my archives is a binder this thick full of handwritten letters from Oral Roberts beginning in 1981. And in that same year, Brother Roberts wrote me a four-page handwritten letter. And in that letter, he said, I was just listening to a message you preached in Anaheim at the West Coast Believers Convention, and he said, you preached prophetically. He said, 
every time I hear you, you preach prophetically. And he encouraged me to continue to do so and not hold back. So today I have a prophetic word for you, praise God. I believe it's for the body of Christ. I've already been preaching it all over America where I've been this year. I have already preached it in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in Africa, and everywhere I've preached it, we are receiving tremendous testimonies of some major, major breakthroughs that people are experiencing. And I believe God's no respecter of persons. So go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, you know, I'm probably next, praise God. And why don't you just go ahead and give the Lord a good shout in advance. Amen. So you'll notice here that in this letter to the Galatian church, Paul did not think it was wrong that he make the people aware of where he was coming from in his ministry. He said, what I teach you, I didn't receive it from man. I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. What I'm going to share with you today and the rest of this week, I didn't hear this from some other preacher, even though there's nothing wrong with that, but I actually received it by revelation of the Lord Jesus. I was um, driving to Vicksburg, Mississippi, my birthplace, on October um, the 29th of this past year. Uh, the farm where I was born, my grandfather bought that place in 1927. And when he passed away, it was handed down to my father and his two brothers. And the two brothers sold their portion off almost immediately. My dad kept his. And then when my mom and dad passed away, it was uh, passed down to my sister and I. And I had not been over there in a number of years. My sister had a daughter that lived there on this same farm where, where I was born. And then when she married and, and uh, began her family, she moved away. So the old farmhouse has been empty for a long time. I hadn't been over there in years. And uh, people started calling me wanting to know if the property was for sale. Well, I really hadn't thought that much about selling it. But I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over there and just walk around the place and, and pray and decide whether or not I want to let it go. I mean, you know, really in the natural, it was of no benefit to me. I mean, I hardly ever get back over there. But my daddy loved that place. Oh, my Lord. He thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom on our farm <laughs> land, you know. And, uh, and, you know, it was a little hard knowing how much my dad loved that place for me to let go of it. So I decided I'm going to just drive over there. So I told Carolyn, I got in my truck. It's about, you know, a little less than 400 miles from here. It's I-20, straight shot on I-20. And so I got in my truck and I said, I'm going to go over there and just spend a few days. I got some time off and, and just decide what I want to do with it. So I drove from here to Shreveport where Carolyn and I actually grew up, where we met each other when I was 11 and she was nine. By the way, in about 14 more days, we'll be married 46 years. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? And uh, my parents had moved us to Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana, when I was a young boy, even though, like I said, we still had the farm over there. And I used to spend my summers there when I was a kid. So I drove to Shreveport, and uh, her mother and a sister still lived there, so went by and saw them and, and went down the street where Carol and I bought our first house and, and uh, went by the place where I grew up. And then I thought, well, I wonder if I can still find Jerry's Paint and Body Shop where I owned an automotive business when Brother Copeland came to Shreveport the first time I heard him. So I went out on North Market and found Jerry's Paint and Body Shop. I thought that place was huge back then. That's the smallest building. I'm telling you, I don't know how I got all that work done in there, but, but uh, you know, I've grown a lot since then. My, I've dreamed bigger now, you know. And I went by there and saw that place and actually saw a couple of guys that I went to high school with and we had a good talk and so forth. And then I proceeded to go on to Vicksburg, Mississippi. I got to Monroe, Louisiana. I stopped, going to have my dinner. Uh, there's a place in Monroe that uh, 
the same places in New Orleans, and Jesse and Kathy have taken me there many times, called Copeland's. And uh, so I stopped in Monroe and had me a good Cajun meal, praise God. Then got in the truck and headed on to Vicksburg. Now I'm out there on I-20 by myself, minding my own business, not bothering anybody, wasn't really even praying. I'm just reminiscing. I went to college for a short time in Ruston, Louisiana, Louisiana Tech. I had buddies that went to Northeastern in Monroe. Uh, I'm just reminiscing. You know, I used to run up and down that highway in my 1957 Chevrolet. And uh, so I'm going to Vicksburg, and I got between Monroe and Rayville, Delhi, and all those little towns. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God spoke to me. I did not expect it. Wasn't really praying or seeking the Lord as to a word from heaven, you know, just enjoying myself. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God said this, 2012 will be a year of fulfillment. He said it will be a year in which highest expectations will be fulfilled. Well, when he said that, I knew it was him. I hadn't even been thinking along those lines. I pulled my truck over and I wrote it down, dated it, October 29, 2011. Then I put under that, 2012, the year of fulfillment, a year in which highest expectations shall be fulfilled. Got in my truck, went on to Vicksburg, checked in the hotel there, uh, not too far from the farm, and, and uh, stayed up all night praying over that, studying it, and uh, then spent the next few days there in uh, Vicksburg and talking to people and decided to sell the place and got a buyer. Some people wanted to buy it and so forth. And, and uh, then I came back home. Well, from the moment I got home, I couldn't get this off my mind. I began studying it again. I did not know at the time the Lord said that to me that the number 12 in the Bible was such a significant number. It literally means fulfillment, completion, and it also represents divine order, divine order. The number 12 is mentioned 187 times in the Bible. 12, it is um, representative of divine order, meaning that, you know, things are in place. Conditions have been met. That's, that sounded good to me right there. How many of you have been waiting and believing God for something for a long, long time? I asked the Lord, I said, what would a year of fulfillment be to you? He turned it around and said, what would a year of fulfillment be to you? So I listed four things. You might want to write them down. This is what a year of fulfillment would be to me. Number one, promises stood upon for a long time finally coming to pass. Wouldn't that be a year of fulfillment? Number two, dreams and visions held fast to finally becoming reality. That'd be a year of fulfillment. Number three, goals persistently pursued finally being achieved. That'd be a year of fulfillment. And then I think maybe you want to shout over this one, seeds sown in faith finally producing their promised harvest. Wouldn't that be a year of fulfillment? Seeds sown in faith, finally producing their promised harvest. Amen. So I wrote that down. And I have, since that moment, been believing that those things were going to happen in my life and ministry during the course of this year. And I'm pleased to announce that many of them have. Hallelujah. And I'm pleased to announce that everywhere I preach this, the testimonies of people experiencing fulfillment have been tremendous. One pastor friend of mine over in London, when I was there in March, he saw uh, my daughter Terry and I teaching this on our television broadcast. And so he grabbed hold of it and he began preaching it to his congregation. Starting back in January when he first heard, heard me preaching it on our television broadcast. So when I arrived at his church in March, when I walked in the door, he said, Brother Jerry, I could hardly wait for you to get here tonight. I said, why? He said, because I have been preaching your messages on the year of fulfillment to our congregation. 
and we are all in agreement. We're believing God that some things that we have been standing for and believing for for a long time are going to manifest this year. And he said, one of the things that we have been believing for for four years now is a piece of property that the church owns for it to sell so that we could put the money into various projects that, that we are involved in right now. And we need money right now. And, and we got this land, but for four years, nobody's even made us an offer. Nobody showed any interest in it. But we began to declare that this is our year of fulfillment, and I could hardly wait for you to get here today because today I closed on that property, and I couldn't wait for you to get here so I could tell you that it's already a year of fulfillment. Hallelujah. Amen. How many of you got land you've been believing to sell? Hold your hand up. You got land you've been believing to sell. Well, say this with me. This is my year of fulfillment. I believe my land will sell. There's a buyer looking for my land right now and will pay what I want for it and give the Lord a shout in advance. Hallelujah. Amen. A year of fulfillment. Now listen to this. Divine order. The Bible tells us that the number of the tribes of Israel are 12. The original number of the disciples which Jesus chose were 12. The new Jerusalem will have 12 foundations with 12 gates, 12 angels at those gates. That's divine order. The first time we hear Jesus say, I must be about my father's business, he's at the age of 12. Notice he didn't say that at 10. He didn't say it at 4. He said it at 12. Everything was in order. Conditions had been met. And now he's saying, I must be about my father's business. When Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, she was at the age of 12. Something Jairus greatly desired was fulfilled. His highest expectation came to pass. And then we're told that the high priest's breastplate had 12 stones representing the 12 tribes. The showbread consisted of 12 loaves. During the times of the judges, there were 12 judges who ruled over Israel, divine order. Jesus originally ordained 12 apostles. During the great tribulation, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel are saved, totaling 144,000. The bride of Christ is pictured with a crown of 12 stars. The new Jerusalem has 12 gates of pearls, 12 angels at the gates, and the name of the 12 tribes of Israel over those gates. The wall of the city has 12 foundations of precious stones in them, and they are the names of the 12 apostles. The wall is 144 cubits high, which is 12, by 12, 12 times 12, and the city is 12,000 furlongs long, which are square, which is 1,500 miles square. So 12 apparently is a very significant number in the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not off into numerology, but at the same time, when the Bible thinks a number is important, then now it's important to me. You know, the number three, Trinity. Number seven, perfection. I remember years ago, um, I was believing God for a particular airplane in our ministry. I had given my, my airplane that I was flying at the time, I gave it to Happy Caldwell's ministry. And I'm believing God for this next level airplane, cabin class, you know, and something fly faster and higher and get us there quicker and carry more people. And I'm believing God for it. And uh, when it finally manifested, which didn't happen overnight, but it finally manifested, Amen. And I emphasize, finally manifested. The number on the, the end number on the tail of that airplane, I did not uh, particularly like. So the first thing I want to do is, you know, request a new end number. And so I, I uh, you know, applied. And I really didn't pray about, you know, the number. It just seemed good on the inside. And I decided that I wanted to apply for the number November 888 JS. 
which means Jerry Savelle or Jesus Saves, whichever you prefer. Hallelujah. Uh, triple Eight, November Triple Eight, JS. And they, they allowed me to have it. So we painted that new number on the tail of the airplane. And um, shortly after that, I ran into Brother Hilton Sutton, and uh, he was getting ready to go somewhere in a meeting. And I said, well, Brother Sutton, uh, the Lord just blessed me with a, a new plane. Why don't I and my pilots come to Houston, pick you up, and we'll fly you there. I want to I I take you there and spend the week with you, and, or the weekend with you, and we'll just take in our airplane. So we flew to Houston, uh, got there at FBO, and Brother Sutton was waiting there. And when he got ready to board my airplane, he looked at the number on the back, and he said, uh, did you paint that number on there? And I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, why did you select that number? I said, well, really, it just seemed good. I really didn't have any kind of spiritual reason for selecting it. It just seemed good. He said, do you know what eight is symbolic of? I said, no, sir. He said, new beginning. And he was right. I mean, that was 1981. And everything changed in my ministry in 1981. It was a new beginning. And I didn't realize that I had painted on that airplane. And from that moment, I mean, everything we did, it was like a new beginning, hallelujah. And God blessed it. So once again, uh, this number is very symbolic. I like the fact that it represents divine order. Look at your neighbor and say, divine order. How many of you know God is in the divine order? I have a, a friend by the name of Dick Rubin. And Dick Rubin is a born-again Jew. And one of the most brilliant men in Old Testament studies I've ever been around. I love talking to Dick. And uh, his ministry, the ministry theme is, when the pattern's right, the glory falls. When the pattern's right, the glory falls. All over the Bible, there are patterns. And when God's patterns are right, then you cannot keep a move of God from taking place. When the pattern's right, the glory of God will manifest. Amen. You know, I believe the body of Christ has been through a lot over the last few years. Many of them have suffered much. Many of them are hurting. I don't know too many people in the body of Christ that haven't been believing God for more finances. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Amen. I mean, you know, people, preachers, ministries, Christian businessmen and women, I mean, everywhere you go, people believe in God for finances. The economy hadn't been like we'd all like for it to be, hadn't been as favorable as we'd like for it to be. Unemployment rate is up. The government hadn't got a clue what to do to fix it. Amen. And the shame is, so many in the body of Christ are suffering right along with the rest of the world. But I just refuse to accept the idea that God doesn't care, that God is oblivious to this. I believe every time Satan tries his best to wipe us out, God's already got a plan in motion. Yes. to bring us to the top. Hallelujah. Yes. Didn't you love what Brother Copeland preached this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, and you'll be the head and not the tail, Amen. above and not beneath. Amen. Another translation says, always on top. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, always on top. Yes. That's where we belong, always on top. Amen? We're not to be the tail, we're to be the head. And even though the body of Christ has been under severe attack, God does not sit by and just let the devil destroy his people. And I believe that there are some things that have now fallen into place, some things that are now in order, and God is saying, and you're going to be rewarded for not giving up in the midst of that, and I'm going to bring to pass what I promised you I would fulfill. This is not the time to give up. This is not the time to quit. This is the time to say, thank God I made it. Hallelujah. 
Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to look at something from Psalm 62 for a moment. Psalm 62. Verse 5, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Underline that phrase. My expectation is from Him. Everything I hope for, everything I desire, everything I believe for was birthed on the inside of me by Him, by His Word. He and His Word are one. You go to the Bible and you find a promise of God, and it is going to birth on the inside of you an expectation of that promise being fulfilled. Isn't that true? I mean, none of you would go around saying or expecting healing if you didn't, first of all, find it in the Word of God. You wouldn't go around saying, I'm believing to prosper if you hadn't, first of all, found it in the Word of God. That promise in the Word is what creates that expectation. Expectation and faith are, are very, very similar. They're, they're one and the same. Jesus said, be it unto thee according to the, as thou hast believed. He could have very easily said, be it unto thee according to thy expectations. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a known fact. You get what you expect the most, good or bad. Whatever you expect the most in your life is what you get. You expect to get laid off? You go around saying that long enough? You're going you're gonna to develop a high expectation in getting laid off. And when you get laid off, that just means you prophesied your own doom. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Huh? Well, you know, flu season's come, and we all expect we'll be down with it. Well, you keep talking like that, keep expecting like that, and you'll wind up with a flu. Isn't it amazing? Negative people can go around talking their expectations all the time, and nobody gets upset. We talk our positive expectations, and then we're fanatics. <laughs> or egotists. I expect to walk in a higher level of the blessing of God. Amen. Well, who do you think you are? Now, the negative person can talk their negative expectations all day long, and nobody will challenge them. In fact, most po folks will agree with them. Amen? I was in the Home Depot in Granbury, Texas uh, last week, <laughs> and I was working down there at my lake house, and I needed some supplies, so I went up to Home Depot, and I'm waiting there to pay, and the cashier asked the guy in front of me, and how's life treating you today? Oh, my Lord, you ought to heard him. <laughs> he wrote a book right there. <laughs> I mean, it was the most negative thing you ever heard in your life. And when he quit, she took up where he left off. <laughs> and you know, most of the people in line, they sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if she'd have asked me, and how's life treating you? Oh, I tell you, I'm blessed. Glory to God. I tell you, I don't know why I'm God's favorite child. I just am. <laughs> Half that line was said, who you think you are. Huh? They get upset when we have positive expectations, Amen. but it's okay in the world and it's okay in many churches to have negative expectations. In fact, some preacher is the most negative person in the whole congregation. Are you still here? My expectations are from him. That means if he's the one who birthed them in you, then he's the one who will fulfill them. Yes, thank you, Lord. 
God is in the business of fulfilling whatever He authors, whatever He births, whatever He originates, whatever He decrees, whatever He vows, whatever He promises, He's in the business of fulfilling it. In fact, many times you'll find certain things that he said he was going to do in the Old Testament, and then over in the New Testament, you'll find them being fulfilled, and usually to be prefaced with that it might be fulfilled. In fact, you'll find that phrase, that it might be fulfilled nine times in the book of Matthew alone, that it might be fulfilled. God's in the business of fulfilling what he says. He never says anything except he intends to back it. He's not like people. God backs what he says. And it doesn't make any difference if it's a thousand years later. If he promised it, it is going to come to pass. You know, I, I believe Keith said this morning that God's funny. Didn't you say that, Keith? God is funny. He does have a sense of humor. There are some things you will read in the Old Testament that God said, and it shall come to pass. A thousand years later, it comes to pass, and the Bible says, suddenly. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) Suddenly. There came a rushing mighty wind. Joel said that a long, long time ago. But in the mind of God, that didn't take very long. What's a thousand years? That's a day to him. Huh? Hallelujah. I believe there's a bunch of people in here about to have some suddenlies. Hallelujah. Amen. Some suddenlies. Hallelujah. My expectation is from him, the Bible says. How many of you have high expectations in here this morning? Is anybody expecting to walk in a higher level of divine health? Anybody expecting to walk in a higher level of divine prosperity? Anybody in here expect to be more blessed this time next year than you are now? Do you really expect that? Where did that expectation come from? It certainly didn't come from CNN. It didn't come from the world. It didn't come from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram or the New York Times. So it had to come from him. Amen? And if it came from him, then he fully intends to see to it that it comes to pass. Now, notice the next verse. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. What's he saying? God put this in me, and I will not be moved until it comes to pass. Can you say amen? Amen. How many of you believe you've received a dream from God, a vision from God? I've had people ask me over the years many, many times, Brother Jerry, how do I know if my dream is really from the Lord? How do I know if this vision is really from God? Can I help you this afternoon? Got your notebook? I'm going to give you seven keys to determine whether or not your dream or vision is from God. Number one, if it captures your imagination and inspires and motivates you every day of your life, then it is most likely a dream or a vision from God. If it captures your imagination and it inspires and motivates you every day of your life, then it's most likely a dream from God. Now, if you can't write them down as fast as I say them, get the CD afterwards. Number two, if it seems impossible and you are unable to fulfill it on your own, then it's most likely a dream from God. I like what I heard Gloria say one time. She said, you know, God's never given Kenneth and I anything to do that was possible. Because if it was possible for them to do it on their own, then it wouldn't require faith. And we know it's impossible to please God without faith. So if the dream you've been carrying around on the inside of you is impossible for you to fulfill it on your own, then it is most likely a dream from God because that's the realm he deals in. Can you say amen? Amen. Number three, 
if it seems as though it will never come to pass, <laughs> but deep down on the inside you're unwilling to give up on it, then it is most likely a dream or a vision from God. If it seems as though it will never come to pass, but deep down on the inside of you, you're unwilling to give up on it, then it's most likely a dream from God. Number four, you'll identify with this one real quick. If not everyone is as enthusiastic about it as you are, <laughs> then it's most likely a dream from God. Amen? You know, there's, there's some people you just can't share your dreams with. Isn't that true? Some people you do not share your vision with. All you'll get out of them is unbelief. If you don't believe it, ask Joseph. Joseph shared his dream with his brothers. And I'd say they weren't as enthusiastic about it as he was. Amen? However, he knew it was a dream from God. And even though he wound up in prison, wound up in slavery, he would not let go of that dream because he knew it was from God. And eventually his dream came to pass, did it not? So, if not everyone is enthusiastic about it as you are, then it's most likely a dream or a vision from God. Number five, you can probably identify with this one too. If you've experienced resistance, setbacks, difficulties, frustration, wanting to quit, <laughs> then it's most likely a dream from God. If you've experienced resistance, setbacks, difficulty, frustration, and even thought about quitting, then it's probably a dream or a vision from God. Is anybody identifying with this yet? Yeah. Number six, if it consumes your thinking and even seems to get bigger and bigger on the inside of you, then it's most likely a dream from God. If it consumes your thinking and even seems to get bigger and bigger on the inside of you, then it's most likely a dream from God. And then number seven, if it seems to define and shape your life, then it is most likely a dream from God. If it defines your life and shapes your life. You know, uh, Jesse and I obviously are very dear friends and love one another as friends and respect one another as co laborers in the Lord. And Jesse, to me, is, is a great evangelist. Jesse can preach anything and people get saved. I don't care what scripture he uses. <laughs> he don't even have to use scripture. <laughs> he can preach on boots. <laughs> he can preach on a dysfunctional family. He can read from a cornflakes box. And come in here and tell us what it said and make it funny and a stinging point to it and 300 people to get saved. <laughs> One time, we, Jesse and Kathy and Carol and I were all in a meeting and, and Jesse's going along there and he's preaching, you know, and he said, now what am I talking about? And all three of us on the front row hollered, we don't have a clue. <laughs> but he knew where it was going. And when he got through, there must have been 100 people come up and got saved. Now, his dream, his passion is bringing people to Christ. He's consumed with it. It has defined and shaped his life. You pick up his magazine, it's all about evangelism. It's all about winning people to Christ. Amen. God put that in him. It consumes his thinking. It's defined his life. When you're convinced that what you're carrying around on the inside of you came from God 
at some point, quit can no longer be an option. Look at your neighbor and say, quit is no longer an option. And the fact that you do have resistance and the fact that you do have setbacks only means you're getting closer. Amen. I think it was Thomas Edison when he was endeavoring to discover the electric light bulb, you know, and, and uh, he, he, he tried over 900 times. And somebody came to him and said, Mr. Edison, you have failed. You've tried over 900 times and you still haven't got it. He said, I haven't failed. I'm getting close. I now know 900 ways it won't work. I am getting close. He just wouldn't give up. Why? It was his dream. It was his vision. Amen. That's the reason, you know, you, you, you see some ministers that, you know, they walk out on, a, on an empty lot. There's nothing but grass out there and trash and debris that people have thrown over a course of years. And they don't see a lot with trash and grass. They see buildings. And it's hard to explain to the non-dreamer. Isn't that right, Keith? To the person that doesn't know how to dream? To the person that doesn't know how to be visionary? It's hard to explain. Why you see something they can't see and why you'd be willing to carry it around with you if it takes a lifetime. But if it's from God, then I shall not be moved. My expectation came from Him. And since God is in the business of fulfilling His Word, then why would I ever want to give up? In my mind, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, but how long? That's the wrong question. See, when you start asking how long, you're on the verge of quitting. Don't ask how long. Ask yourself, am I willing to stand forever if it takes that long? That's true. Brother Hagin, you say, if you're willing to stand forever, then it won't take very long. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Well, I got a good report for you. You know, people like this that come to believers' conventions, even though, you know, there, there are people that come to these meetings that, will come to the Lord for the first time. Jesse will see to that. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, the majority of you in here, you know, you're, you're saying you're believers. You believe the Word of God. You believe the Word of faith. You've already had experiences where God has come through in impossible-looking situations. You've been standing for quite a long time for other impossible-looking situations to come to pass. Well, the fact that you didn't do what so many others do, run from God when it looks like it's not working, run from the Word when it looks like it's not working, get out of that faith environment when it looks like it's not working. You didn't do that. In fact, you've done what Paul said. He said, if you will not grow weary in well-doing, then you will reap. In other words, you will have your fulfillment. You are going to see what you have been standing for, waiting for, expecting, believing for, refusing to give up on, come to pass. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Amen. The Lord instructed me to tell you to do this. Got your pen and paper out? Yeah. Write down your three highest expectations for 2012. What are your three highest expectations for 2012? You believing to get out of debt? Believing for your marriage to be restored? Believing for your family to come into the knowledge of the truth? Believing God for that dream home? Believing God that this is... This is the year that you'll finally be able to launch out into your own business, your own ministry. What are your three highest expectations? You say, well, why would God tell you to do that? You'll have to ask Him. 
Well, why only three? He didn't say only three. He just said right down your three highest. I think God knows human nature. Getting people to write down anything sometimes can be a major faith project. I've had people do this everywhere I've been across the world in the last six months. And it amazes me how some people just sit there and look at you and just act like, I ain't writing nothing. <laughs> well, that's between you and God. But it is a proven fact that people who write their goals are more apt to see them come to pass than those who don't. You go to any motivational seminar in this country, you go to any bookstore and you go through the self-help section and pick up any book that shows you how to, you know, make life better, and there's going to be a chapter in there somewhere about writing your goals. Yeah. Now, I just want you to know Earl Nightingale didn't think of that. Napoleon Hill didn't think of that. Almighty God was the one who said, write the vision. They got it from him. They just don't always give him credit for it. Write the vision. I think this is interesting. I've been doing a lot of study on this. I think this is interesting. In my Old Testament word study book in my library, the word vision in the little Hebrew is also defined as prophetic revelation or divine oracle from God. So when it says write the vision, it's write the prophetic revelation. Write the divine oracle from God. Write it down. Why? So that every time you read it, you will run with it. That means every time you read it, it will inspire you. It will energize you. It will motivate you. It will keep you focused. And then it says, and though it tarry, wait for it, it will surely come. Amen. Now that's God. That's not first Jerry. That's Habakkuk. Amen. So right now, now what what I noticed, this, is so, this has been so much fun, having people write down their three highest expectations, because I've noticed how technology has changed in the believers' conventions. People still use, you know, notebooks like Billy here to write their notes, but most of them now are using these iPads and these iPhones. That notes section you got, that's really even better because we have no guarantee you'll know where that sheet of paper is by the time you get out that door. But you ain't going nowhere without that iPhone. Amen. 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 So if you got an iPhone, get in the notes section there and write down your three highest expectations. Or write down your three highest expectations in your iPad because I know you're going to have that with you all the time. Yeah. The Bible said every time you read it, run with it. This time tomorrow, you'd be wondering, what did I do with that stupid sheet of paper? But you got that iPhone with you. Amen. Write them down. Now, I was in Melbourne, Australia earlier this year, and I was there for three nights. We, we had an auditorium we were using and, and uh, uh, was there for three nights. I told the people on the first night to write down their highest expectations and I said, and then the last night, I'm going to lay hands on everybody in this building and believe God together with you that your highest expectations will be fulfilled. Now, there's several hundred people in the meeting. And uh, so the last night, people started lining up and they came by me and I laid hands. I said, now bring, bring your highest expectations with you. I'm not just going to lay hands on you. I want to see your highest expectations. I'm not going to read them. I just want to see them. And I'm going to lay hands on them, believe God with you. So here they come. Man, they started. People had sheets of paper. People had written them in their Bible. The majority of them put that iPhone and that iPad in front of me where I could lay my hands on it. But one lady, this one lady, apparently she didn't have her iPhone. I don't know if she even owned an iPad. And apparently she had no paper. But she was not going to miss out on this, so she wrote them on the palm of her hand. Her three highest expectations. She made up her mind, I'm not missing out on this. She was a, I later found out she was a, a single mom. I don't know if her husband had passed away or went through a divorce or what. 
a single mom trying to raise three children on her own. Her number one highest expectation was a new car big enough to hold me and my three children and all the stuff she needed to carry around for their activities, and she wanted it paid for. Number two, she, wanted, she was believing God for increase in finances. And number three, a godly husband. Well, a couple of, oh, four or five weeks later, we get this photo of her brand new van, fully equipped and totally paid for, praise God. She already had a year of fulfillment. If nothing else happened to her, something she'd been believing for for a long time had come to pass. Wow. Now, another couple in that same meeting, another couple in that same meeting came up to me, and they're partners with my ministry in Australia. And they said, we're believing God. Our highest expectation is to be out of debt this year. They said, now, we've been working on this for several years now, you know, listening to all you guys, and we made a decision back a few years ago that we're going to get out of debt. And said, we've now got it down. You know, they went from several hundred thousand dollars down to they only had $40,000 left, and they'd be out of debt. So they put as their highest expectation that this year, we will be debt free. So I laid hands on them and believed God with them. The next morning, my director and I were flying from Melbourne to Sydney where I was going to be preaching in the Hillsong churches. And uh, what is that, Jesse? A couple hour flight, two and a half hour flight, something like that, three hours maybe. So Saturday morning, we're flying to Sydney. When we get to Sydney and get to the baggage claim, we're standing there waiting for our baggage, and my director turned his cell phone on, and when he did, he had a text from that couple that were believing God to be out of debt that I prayed for the night before. And they said, please share this testimony with Brother Jerry. Their banker had tried to get a hold of them on Friday, but couldn't reach them because they were endeavoring to get to the meeting. So he called them Saturday morning and said, uh, I have to inform you that we've got to put a freeze on your account at the bank because a deposit has been made in your account in error. We know it's not yours because you have never made a deposit this large before, and this money belongs to somebody else in the bank, and somehow it got in your account, so we're putting a freeze on it. You can't write checks. You can't make any withdrawals until we get this straightened out. And this is Saturday morning. They said, well, how long is that going to take? He said, we don't know, but as soon as we get it cleared up, we'll call you and let you know. They said, well, is it going to be more than a day or two? We don't know. Well, we need, to, we need to write checks next week for, you know, utilities and things like that. You cannot write a check until we get this cleared up. Now, this is in the text, the testimony. This all happened in a matter of two and a half hours, whatever t amount of time it takes to fly from Melbourne to Sydney. The banker called them back and said, we have now discovered who that money belongs to, and he is very sorry for the inconvenience. They said, well, it actually wasn't any inconvenience. It's only been two and a half hours since you called us. He said, well, I know that, but the man who made the deposit in your account in error wants to call you and apologize personally for the inconvenience. Can I give him your number? They said, there's no inconvenience. It only took two and a half hours. No problem. He said, he wants to call you and talk to you anyway. May I give him your number? They said, yes. The man called them and said, I am very apologetic for what happened. Uh, I made a deposit and it got in your account by mistake and I just wanted to make it up to you. He said, uh, no problem. We, we, no damage done. We've only, it's only been two and a half hours. He said, no, I, I, I am very sorry for the inconvenience. He said, I'm a very generous man. I like helping people. I'd like to do something for you for the inconvenience. They said, there's no need. He said, is there any debt I can help you pay off? He said, is there any debt I can help you pay off? They said, are you serious? He said, yes, I'm serious. They said, well, 
The only debt we have is $40,000, and we're believing God that we're going to be out of debt this year. He said, well, I'll call the bank right back, and I'll make a deposit. You consider yourself debt-free right now and put $40,000 in their account. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me ask you a question. Come on. I want you to be just as honest as you possibly can. On your best day of trying to help God meet your need, could you dream up that scenario? No, you couldn't. Look at your neighbor and say, you're cute, but you're not that smart. <laughs> I mean, on your best day, and don't, don't sit there and look at me and tell me you hadn't tried to help God before. I have. I'll be honest with you. You know, God was taking too long, and I thought he needed some help. I thought, dear God, he's got all of y'all. He's trying to meet your needs. He forgot about me, so I better help him. And it don't take but one time of doing that, because every time you help God, when he don't need your help, all he needs is your faith, then you will wind up producing an Ishmael. You don't want Ishmael's, you want Isaac's. Yeah. Ishmael's are of the flesh, Isaac's are of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, you couldn't dream that up. I mean, you're sitting there saying, God, now I know you can do this, but how are you going to do it? How are you going to get me out of debt this year? I know, God. I believe I got it. Have somebody... Wait a minute, Lord, it's coming to me. <laughs> Have somebody make a, a deposit in my account in error. That'll do it, Gord. That'll do it, God. And what are we going to do from there? Oh, and have them call me and apologize <laughs> and then tell me they'd like to pay off my debt. That's all you got to do, God. I got it figured out. You couldn't figure that out. <laughs> Look at the neighbor on the other side and say, you're even cuter, but you're not that smart. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you're not that smart, but God is. I've been saying for years, God's got more ways to meet our needs than we could dream up in a thousand years. You know, as soon as my director read that testimony with me, I lifted my hands right there in that baggage claim and began to praise God with my partners over what God had just done. And then my next thought was, I wonder what he's dreaming up for me right now. I wonder what he's dreaming up for you while you're sitting right here, right now, daring to believe that he is the God who fulfills. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, give him your best shout. Terry, stand up. My daughter, Terry, over here. Stand up, Terry. Give her a good hand. When, uh, when Terry graduated from high school, eventually she enrolled in uh, Texas Tech, graduated from Texas Tech with honors, and uh, majored in French. She wanted to be a high school teacher, teach French, teach math. She, she, was, she was brilliant and all that. In fact, she tutored some of the football players at Tech so they could keep playing football, and she'd help them in math, you know. And uh, so she graduated with honors, came home. Going to be a school teacher, high school teacher. Couldn't find a job, no openings. She got to substitute maybe, what, twice, four times, something like that. Well, she, she, she met Rodney when she was at Tech, and they got married, and, and now, you know, they need income, and she's trying to get on with the school district and all that, and they don't have any openings. So she comes over and says, Daddy, can I work at the ministry until something opens up? I said, sure. So she came over and worked at the ministry. Well, she got over there and started in one department, and you know, and then worked her way into another department and got over there and fell in love with what she's doing, forgot about all that school teaching, 
Now I'm thinking, four years. <laughs> I paid good money for a Texas redhead to come out speaking fluent French. What are we going to do with this? Ain't nobody in Fort Worth talks French. Now, if she'd have taken Spanish, we'd have been right there. Praise God. I mean, that's the other language in Fort Worth. You know, French? What are we going to do with that? Well, I'd preached in France before, but I hadn't been there in a while, and so I was invited to come over to France and, and preach, and so I took Terry with me. I thought, well, I'm going to get something out of this. She can order a meal for me. <laughs> you remember when we all went over there, glory, and it was so hard communicating with the people in the restaurants because we didn't speak French? I thought, well, at least Terry can order my meal and get me around town. She can talk to the taxi driver. That ought to be worth something. Hallelujah. <laughs> Got over there and and uh, then she fell in love with the people where we were preaching. And the pastor's wife, she's Parisian. And, and they started emailing one another, you know. And, and then uh, not long after that, uh, Brian Houston of uh, Hillsong in Australia, they opened a Hillsong church in Paris, wanted me to go preach in that church. Went over there and took Terry there as well. Well, they just hit it off, the, you know. She and the French-speaking people. Yeah. You know, it's amazing when daddy has to stand off to the side and, and daughter and the pastors are just talking up a storm. I ain't got a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> but they fell in love with Terry and found out she preaches and started asking her to come over. A man, God just, God put France in her heart. And, and she began to realize that this, all this was not waste, that God had put something major in her heart about the nation of France. I remember sitting in T.L. Osborne's office one day. He invited me to come and spend the afternoon with him. And Brother Osborne told me of all the nations he'd ever preached in, that France was the most ungodly nation he'd ever preached in. Less than 3% Christians. And it touched his heart so that he went to France and spent, I think he said, six months just to learn the language so he could preach in their own language because he had such compassion for the French, uh, the nation of France. And, and we began to realize that God was ordering steps here, that God had dropped that in her heart. It wasn't just her idea. So they kept asking her to come back. And everywhere she went, man, she just having move a God. The altars are filled with young people. She did her first book in French and took teams of, of women over to France and they distributed thousands of them to the, to the French in the streets, Paris and other cities. So about five years ago, when she realized, God, you, you are really putting this nation on my heart. She come up to me one day and said, Dad, you're called to Africa. I'm called to Paris. I said, there's something wrong with this picture. <laughs> I'm in them mud huts and she's at the Eiffel Tower, Jesse. You know? But hey, I feel about Africa the way she feels about France, you know. And she's, she's about five years ago, she wrote down in her journal that she was believing God that the largest church in France was going to ask her to speak because from that church there were many satellite churches that covered that whole nation. And God had laid on her heart about 20 different cities in France that she was to preach and to bring the gospel. And she said, if God would open that door for me, that would give me the exposure into that nation I'm believing God for. Now, five years ago, she wrote that down. When I came back home from that trip to Mississippi and told my staff what the Lord had said to me, that this is going to be a year of fulfillment, Terry got out what she had written down that she'd been believing God for for five years, that the largest church in France is going to ask me to speak, that the largest publisher in France is going to want to do one of my books. Five years she believed God for that. But this year, 
is the year of fulfillment. While I was preaching in London, was that March, Terry? While I was preaching in London in March, I get out of the service, go back to my hotel, I pick up my phone, and there's a text from my daughter, Terry. She said, Dad, you can't see the tears in this text, but I'm standing on the platform of the largest church in France, and they've been clapping for over 20 minutes. They will not sit down. They love my ministry. Year of fulfillment. Is that true? Year of fulfillment. Not only that, but she sent me a picture just a few weeks ago where she was sitting in the largest bookstore in Paris autographing her new book. And it's gone all over the country. Now, you, you come to the Savelles and say, I don't believe it's a year of fulfillment. You're too late. <laughs> I'm telling you things we've been believing God for for a long time have been coming to pass all year, hallelujah. A year of fulfillment. Now, I want to challenge you to write down your three highest expectations because before the week's up, I'm not going to lay hands on everybody in the building, but I am going to pray over you and believe God that those things are going to come to pass during the course of this year. Amen. Now, let me, let me close it with this. If Jesus, no, well, first of all, I want, you to, I want you to look down at those three highest expectations. Look at them. If Jesus was to walk into this building right now in the flesh, knowing that you had needs in your life that are represented by those three highest expectations, the first thing I believe he would say to you is this. What, and I'm using it Elizabethan English style, what wilt thou that I should do for you. Isn't that what he said to people? In other words, what would you like for me to do for you? That's the first thing he'd ask you. Once you told him, read those three highest expectations, the next thing I believe would come out of his mouth is this. Do you believe I'm able to do this? Isn't that what he said to people he ministered to? Do you believe I am able to do this? I want you to look down at those three highest expectations again. And I want to ask you a question. And you just indicate by the nodding of your head. Do you believe that he's big enough, powerful enough, caring enough that he's able to do that? Yes. Is he able to do that? Yes. Is he able to get you out of debt? Yes. Is he able to heal your body? Yes. Is he able to restore your marriage? Yes. Is he able to sell that property? Is he able to get you in that dream house? Yes. You really believe he's able to do that? Yes. Well, he asked one man that one time. And the man said, yes, Lord. And something happened to him. He got exactly what he expected. Now, another man came up to him one time and said, Lord, I do not have any problem believing that you're able to do this. <laughs> Apparently, he'd heard about the other miracles that Jesus had performed. And he said, I don't have any problem believing you're able to do this. My problem is, I'm not sure if you will. I know you can, I just don't know if you will. And Jesus helped him with two words, I will. I will. So Jesus would ask you, what would you like for me to do for you? Number two, do you believe I'm able to do that? And the third thing he'd say to you, I will. My Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
and if his attitude to the people, toward the people back then was, I can and I will, then his attitude is the same to his people today. I can and I will. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, give him a shout if you believe it. Amen. Amen. I can and I will. Here's my last verse for today. Go to Psalm 145. While you're turning there, say, My God, my God is, the God who fulfills. is the God who fulfills. Now, I began teaching this back in October at our church here. Spent about four weeks on it. And, of course, I've preached all over the world since, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Psalm 145, and look at verse 19. He will... Fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. That verse did not talk about his ability at all. Apparently it is understood he can do that. It's talking about what he will do. He will fulfill. Underline those three words. He will fulfill. Why? That's, that's what he does. He's in the business of fulfilling everything he says. He will fulfill the desire. Well, isn't that what you just wrote down there? Your three highest expectations? Is that not the desire of your heart for 2012? He will fulfill the desire of them that reverence him, that love him, that honor him. Is anybody in here that loves, reverences, and honors the Lord God on high? Yes. Then he promises he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will hear their cry, and he also will save them. So I decree and declare unto you in the name of Jesus that you are headed for a year of fulfillment. Yes. Come on, give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, you can shout better than that. Amen. Amen. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, wage a good warfare with the prophecies or the prophetic word that has been spoken over you. I've spoken the prophetic over, uh, word over you this afternoon. And God wants you to have a year of fulfillment. Amen. Now you take that, you hold fast to it, you wage a warfare with it if necessary, and God will fulfill it. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. You receive that today? Look at somebody, smile real big and say, I receive it. I receive it. Amen.